The price of food has gone up. The price of uh, basic necessities has gone up. In the referendum, the rural areas that had, that had gained something from the reforms in the land, they voted en masse in favour of Chavez. The urban areas, the workers and the poor in the barrios, unfortunately abstained in this case. Many of them, by the way, now regret that they abstained, according to the comrades we've discussed within Venezuela. But nevertheless, it is an indication of the way that the situation has developed. The private sector has not been crushed in Venezuela. As a matter of fact, based upon the development of the oil, private industry and private capitalism has developed in Venezuela in the next period itself. There are five big monopolies that control the economy in Venezuela with the banks. They remain untouched. You cannot call it a socialist revolution when the power still remains in the hands of big business itself. In fact, Chavez has nationalized very little. I have here the constitution of the new party that's been developed in Venezuela, the PSUV, the party that, uh, that, uh, that Chavez has been campaigning on. Because of time, I won't be able to quote here, I might do when I reply, some of the clauses in this constitution. It seems very radical, by the way. Some of it talks about workers, it talks about popular councils. Some, about, some of it talks about a planned economy. By the way, they, in part of it, they also mistakenly have opened up the perspective of a new third world war. I don't know why the hell it's in the constitution, but that's just kind of thrown in to this particular constitution. But we won't kind of develop that point at the moment. It's got some progressive features in this. I mean, it, by the way, that paragraph, it just cancels out everything they say about the bright socialist future. You know, because uh, if you're saying about world war, what are the working class and the poor going to do in this situation? Just allow the ruling class of the world to proceed to a third world war? We've always argued against that. But that's another issue. But in this constitution, it's quite radical. But one thing that's very striking in it is nowhere does it mention the independent role of the working class. We read, we, we, we read about Comandante uh, Hugo Chavez. We read about the PSUV of the one party of the revolution. No, you cannot impose a party, one party from above. That will immediately raise hostility and opposition amongst working class people because of the experience of Stalinism, of a one party totalitarian regime and what that meant as far as the working class is concerned. Following the defeat of the uh, constitution, of the referendum, Chavez has now said, well, the regime has to retreat. And he's, he's, he's outlined three uh, different headings, revision, rectification, and a relaunching. And he said, as opposed to a speedy transition towards socialism, Venezuela must now proceed at a donkey's pace. Now, I don't know how fast the donkey goes. I mean, sometimes they go quickly, and sometimes they go very slowly, and sometimes they stand still, even if you beat them with a stick. Nobody actually knows what he's driving at in relation to this, but what it means is, in effect, a move towards the right, and even worse. He's saying to the Venezuelan people, you've let me down. You've let Hugo, Hugo Chavez down by not voting for my constitution. It reminds me of what Bertolt Brecht said after the 1953 East German uprising, when the Stalinist regime issued a, a leaflet and said, the, people, the, people, the, the government is very disappointed in the people. And Bertolt Brecht issued a statement and said, well, why doesn't the government dissolve the people well? Because uh, to show, ironically, how out of touch was the Stalinist regime? We had an element of this in Chavez's statement at the present time. He tried to develop a parallel economy. Now, there's no way you can do that under capitalism. Before Marx came onto the scene, the great Robert Owen and the socialist utopians developed model colonies. They were marvelous. They showed what was possible in a future society. Fourier, Saint-Simeon, and Robert Owen. Marx drew on that. But it was like trying to change society behind the backs of society. Only by taking hold of the levers of economic power, creating an alternative state, would it be possible to establish the, the beginnings of socialism, at least in Venezuela, which Chavez is not posing at this stage. And I would pose another issue here. Even if in Venezuela, or any society that comes to that, 
you managed to, to the government managed to nationalise the commanding heights of the economy. We in Britain stand for a government, a socialist government, to take over 150 of the major monopolies. That would just be the beginning. If you did not have conscious democratic control by the population, led by the working class, you would inevitably have a bureaucratic features, even in an advanced industrial country like Britain. After all, we are plagued by bureaucracy in the trade union movement of Britain. Of a trade union leadership paid four, five, ten times more than the average worker, out of touch and not reflecting the real moods that are taking place. If that exists in an advanced industrial country like Britain, you can say that that would exist in any society, particularly in the neo-colonial world. And the transition from capitalism to socialism means the conscious participation, not just to be consulted, but workers' control, workers' management that exist as existed in Russia in 1917 to 1923. That was in a backward country with the level of technique and expertise that exists today. It'd be perfectly possible to involve the majority of the population of the running, the managing and the control of society. I now have to turn, and therefore the perspectives for Venezuela are very conditional. In the time I've got left, I have to very quickly turn to the developments in Bolivia and in Brazil. And Bolivia, in a way, is on a par with the developments that are taking place in Venezuela. In a sense, I would say, civil war, or the possibility of civil war, is posed much more sharply in Bolivia, maybe in the short term, than is the case in Venezuela at the present time. We have a presence, by the way, in Cochabamba, of a young comrade, a young student comrade who came from the west coast of America, very, very short time in the organization, wandered down to Bolivia. Comrades have been waiting for years in Swansea for a revolution or a radicalization. He walked into the middle of a, rev of a revolution, because that's what it was, picked up members like a man strolling in the countryside picking, picking up blackberries because of the radicalization that has developed and has given us, in some of the material he sent to us, a really graphic picture of the situation that is developing at the moment. It's not possible to deal with this, but I would advise all the young communities and the, the young, more experienced communities who are here today, the more mature communities, if I can put it like that, who are here today, study the history of the Bolivian working class. It is absolutely incredible. There are very few countries in the world where you see again and again the working class attempting to take the power. One indication of how explosive Bolivia is, is Bolivia's national palace, it's called the Plaza Quimado, is, is Spanish for burned palace. Because it's been, been burned down so many times by the working class and the peasants marching into the center of La Paz. One historian described Bolivia because <coughs> <coughs> because of the huge kind of resources that exist in Bolivia, but of, of, of a scattered population, as a beggar sealed on a throne of gold. Now, after all the experiences that the workers have, and peasants have experienced in Bolivia, they brought to power in 2005 the, the government of Evo Morales of the mass movement towards socialism. It did represent, and does represent, a new chapter, a very potentially radicalizing chapter in the experience of Bolivia itself. By the way, Trotskyism has always had a powerful influence in Bolivia. The poor was a semi-mass party that participated in the revolution of 1952. And the movement taking place in Bolivia is both a class movement <coughs> against landlordism and capitalism and imperialism, and particularly the privatizations of water and the indigenous energy resources of Bolivia in the earlier part of this decade in the 1990s. But it goes together, it's both a class movement, but it's also a national revolt of the indigenous people of Bolivia who account for something like 60% of the population itself. The conditions of the masses are indescribable. In some of the mining areas, the, life, the average lifespan of a male is less than 40. For the female, just over that. That hasn't been altered by Morales coming to power. And therefore, the dynamism of the mass movement is connected with the terrible social conditions and the urgency of any regime coming to power to begin to change its situation. 